In the year of the consulship of Gerges and Clipsina, 478 years since the founding of Rome, the Galatians went to war once again. Paid a sum of almost a thousand pounds of gold after negotiations with the king of Bithynia, Magarix raised a force of Gauls 4,000 strong and marched towards the city of Oconion from the east. I was permitted to accompany this expedition and was afforded the honour of riding with the king's cavalry. Despite my reputation in Rome, I was in fact a reasonably skilled rider and have only improved since under the guidance and tutelage of my Gallic peers, whose mastery of the art of horsemanship I believe to be unparalleled in the Mediterranean. My role was not that of a warrior, however, but instead as the king's notary. Magarix had paid close attention to my enthusiasm for the written word, and for many months now, my original task of writing a history of Persia had long since fallen by the wayside. The already neglected Hall of Records in Ancyra was destroyed in the great fire that engulfed the city a year prior, and most of my resources went up in smoke along with it. In place of this work, however, Magarix had employed me as a scribe and chronicler in return for a generous wage and an official place within his circle. This offer was difficult to refuse, both for risk of causing offence, and also because, as previously mentioned, the king was munificent with payment in all matters of state, and this was no exception. To acquire a sum of wealth independent of the Cornelii family coffers in Rome was an exciting prospect to me at the time. The presence of a Roman scribe did offer some base amusement to the other tribal nobles, however, one of whom opined in jest that I should be placed in command of the baggage train. Magarix, in a shrewd gesture, accepted the notion at face value and made it so. For the continuation of the expedition, in addition to my original duties, I organised the supply chain of the army with Roman discipline and efficiency in all matters, which earned the grudging respect of the king's circle of chieftains. In late spring, Magarix's 4,000 Gauls met and defeated 2,000 Lydians upon the slopes of the hills outside the city of Iconian. The outnumbered Greeks were overwhelmed and defeated by our superior numbers and by the terrain, as our force had marshalled upon the higher ground with much greater alacrity than the defenders. Following this, the city was plundered in the Gallic manner, with its material wealth being carried away and a number of slaves taken, many of whom were bound for sacrifice or use in auguries by the king's seers. This wealth was divided between the tribes, though naturally the Tectosiges claimed the lion's share, followed by the Tlistobogi the Trochmai, and then the smaller tribes in that order. Following this victory, I was given yet another task. Accompanied by a handful of armed riders, I was, in an act of remarkable and calculated trust by Magarix, dispatched south to the city of Sidae, ruled by the Ptolemies of Egypt. Second largest of Alexander's successor kingdoms, Ptolemaic Egypt was arch-enemy to the Seleucids, with whom they were engaged in a protracted war at the time. Magarix wished to make himself known to Ptolemy's people, for they might pay his Gauls a great deal of money to employ them in war, far more than the sum accepted from the Bithynians. We were granted an audience with the city magistrate, after a long wait of nearly three hours, whereupon, after greeting us, he proceeded to make a number of prickly remarks, claiming it odd that the king of the Gauls should send a pet Roman to speak for him. I explained in turn that he was lucky to be talking to this Roman, for the king himself, or any Gaul for that matter, would have killed him where he stood for making such a comment. However, I had anticipated a moment like this long beforehand, and so I motioned to one of my companions who brought forth a wooden chest containing the severed head of the former magistrate of Iconion. Evidently, he had been familiar to this Ptolemaic stooge, for the Egyptian seemed to recognise the dead man's countenance without need for an introduction. Further to this, I delivered the message of the king, which was a simple one. Magarix would soon rule all of Lydia, and his enemies would suffer a similar fate to this one. But he did not consider the people of Sidae, nor the great Ptolemy, to be his enemy. In fact, he wished to consider them friends, and having borne witness to the Gauls' recent displays of martial prowess, he hoped that Ptolemy might consider the value of such warriors in his just and rightful war against the wretched Seleucids. After this, we departed leaving the head behind to aid the magistrate in his deliberations. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to Let's Play Rome 2 Total War. It's the Galatian campaign as usual, and, uh, well, when we left off previously, we conquered Lydia. 
made it ours and uh, now we're considering our next steps basically where we want to expand to next and I think where we want to expand to next is probably oh grab myself a big nice slice of the Seleucid Empire I think uh, yes please I think that's the natural choice of where to go we'll have a natural ally in the form of the Ptolemies we'll make our other neighbors happier um, maybe if we're clever and we're lucky we might be able to uh, rope the, 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 the rope the kingdom of Pontus into it as well what I definitely quite like is Tarsos and Antioch um, maybe Thapsacos as well maybe it does maybe not the tricky thing is that um, I'd like to go on a sort of rampaging and sacking and raiding expedition all the way through um, down here but uh, the, the, the inherent problem with it is is that that's actually really hard to do in this game like uh, going on a sacking rampage deep into enemy territory is actually incredibly difficult to do versus just taking settlements because if you take settlements you can replenish your troops and recover your losses after a battle if you're deep in enemy territory though you never get to recover your losses so you're just being whittled down constantly 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 um, so it's it's weird but like there's there's rarely a good reason to sack in this game versus simply loot and occupy there's rarely a good reason to do it other than you know for like role playing purposes i guess i think you, by doing it you can you can potentially cause some problems for the enemy by lowering their public order as a result of the sacking and stuff like that but I, i'm pretty sure the ai in this mod gets some pretty amazingly hefty public order cheats in order to stop them from being consumed by rebellion uh i've noticed that in this campaign and and, and particularly in others that i've been playing lately that um, the ai cities just never seem to go into negative public order ever ever and if you play as that faction yourself though you load up the same campaign and you switch you, you switch over to that faction instead lo and behold as if by magic all of your provinces are in like negative public order they don't they don't have whatever cheats the ai's got going on so i don't think even sacking for the purpose of stirring up rebellion even works because the ai just cheats like with its public order so uh yeah i don't know how i'm gonna approach that what i do know is that i do definitely want tarsos and antioch for myself and we'll, we'll just play it by ear from there i think i don't know when exactly i'm going to declare war but it will be soon rest assured um in the meantime uh there's been a couple of mod changes um i've installed a few new mods probably not a wise thing to do mid playthrough it's something i generally try to avoid at all costs when i'm playing various games like this but um all the mods i installed were purely cosmetic in nature and therefore i don't think they'll cause any problems i've tested it pretty extensively by installing them midway through a Mithridatic Wars playthrough I'm doing at the moment um, in the background alongside this and I haven't had any issues so the uh, the mods will be in the description but the short version is I've got one I've got a font mod which changes the in-game font to make it a bit bigger and bolder and more easy for me to read with my crappy old man vision um, and maybe a little easier for people to read at home on mobile devices I don't know um, additionally what else was there oh i got a mod which changes the building icons down here into lovely little pictures instead of just the colored symbols admittedly the colored symbols made it easy to tell at a glance what type of building a thing was but um i've never been a fan of that kind of abstract art, art style when it comes to this sort of stuff i prefer the uh, late 90s early 2000s um little colored pictures vibe of, of ui design and so that's why i installed this mod it, it works as a nice counterpart to the Warriors nicely illustrated unit cards that dei comes with by default uh, this basically just does the same thing but for the for the buildings and i rather like it so that's another thing i installed another one is uh, if we go to diplomacy i installed a mod a series of mods called triple a generals i think it's called um, so you'll notice that some of the no local rulers and generals and things, they look a bit different um, to how they usually do um, because they've been overhauled and stuff. And uh, the, the way that the mods in that series work is it, it changes the appearance of the general based on his rank 
and also his appearance will change as he gets older as well which in vanilla they don't you can have like a 70 year old general and he'll still look like he's in his 30s um which is a bit silly um but uh, with the mod they'll actually visibly get older and stuff tragically it doesn't apply to the barbarian factions the guy who makes them who's making that mod series hasn't got around to the barbarian factions yet so magarix and all his barbarian chums on the faction screen here they'll just they'll look the same as ever um i don't mind it so much though because out of all the vanilla factions the barbarians seem to have the greatest and coolest variety of different like appearances for their generals so it's not so bad in their case um, I mean all these guys look very very different from each other although there's a distinct lack of giant mustaches I've noticed with uh, with the with this faction uh, there's nobody with huge huge Gallic mustaches everyone's just sort of got like a five o'clock shadow it's just completely unacceptable if you ask me but hey no mind <laughs> um yeah, and the other mod I installed is one that overhauls the female characters in the game because in vanilla, they all basically look like the exact same person, just with a different coloured hair. Um, so I installed a mod, I think it's called The Ancient Women or something like that. It's a weird name for a mod, but basically it just makes all the female characters in the game look a lot more varied and different. Uh, so you'll see Aki Tawanez here. It looks a bit different now. Her hair color has changed completely. Um, she's wearing a little, uh, I don't know what you'd call that, tiara thing. She's got big earrings, uh, stuff like that. Melina looks roughly about the same, I think. She just, her clothes have changed slightly, but other than that, she's about the same. Um, but I felt that was a must-have because I was always really annoyed at how, like, all the female characters... In, in this game by default in vanilla they all look like clones of one another and it just sort of ruins the immersion a bit when when that happens so uh, that mod fixes that and makes them actually all look distinct from each other which is nice um i think that's everything that's all the mod changes literally as you can see just just cosmetic stuff uh none of it affects the gameplay um so it should be fine um Right, there's not much else for me to say at this point other than welcome back. Um, and soon, soon, I'm going to keep my eye on what these Bithynians get up to, actually. I'm sort of worried that they might try and take one of these cities before I get a chance to do it myself. That would be irritating. That would be very irritating. In fact, I mean, I don't actually see right now any Seleucid armies in the region. Move Preto over here to try and get a bit more line of sight, but no, he's not going to make it far enough. Um, so I'm a little bit, uh, yeah, I don't want you doing to me what I did to you guys with Pessinus. I don't, I don't want you sniping Antioch from out, out from under me. If they did, it wouldn't be the end of the world, admittedly. Antioch represents a bit of a problem for us in that it is a port city. Now, on the one hand, that's cool because it gives us access to sea trade, which could make us richer. On the other hand, it's a problem because we are Gauls. And uh, naval warfare is something that we simply don't do. Um, in the game, the, the Gallic um, sea roster, the naval unit roster, is absolutely tiny. I think it's only like four units. And even then, the game is being, I'm pretty sure, ahistorically generous towards us in that respect. The, the Gauls in real life just did not do naval warfare. It just it wasn't a thing they did they did water-based trade you know they had um you know they did lots of stuff on rivers and coastlines and whatnot um Bibracta, located somewhere around here-ish was located on a big nexus of rivers and they did lots of river-based trade on that um and there, there was some small scale raiding stuff as well the um the the irish celts embarked on raids across the Irish Sea into Wales and places like that on very small rowboats and things but that's what we're talking about really small rowboats that's that's, that's what we're, not even like Viking longships like small rowboats is the pretty much the extent of uh, of, of Celtic seamanship shall we say nothing that can compete with the huge uh, triremes and 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 you know whatever I don't know I don't ships are called to be honest with you but all the big military naval ships of the romans and the greeks and whatnot so um by taking antioch we'll be opening ourselves up to naval assaults um 
which is going to be something we'll, we'll really struggle to deal with, uh, unfortunately. We will struggle to repel assaults like that, um, because I am going to take this sort of historical angle here, and I'm not going to be spamming out stacks of Gallic warships to uh, rival the Mediterranean powers in the naval arena, because it's just a historical as hell, and I just don't want to do it. It would ruin my immersion, and that's basically what it boils down to. Um, what I'd be curious to see is if, because DEI, one of the ma most amazing features of this mod is the AOR recruitment system, um, which is what allows us to, for example, um, I'll take you out of patrol stance for a second, old, me old, mate, me old mate. It allows us to do things like recruit the, the Cappadocian levies here, for, for instance. It's got, a little, it's got a little banner symbol next to it, which tells you it's an AOR unit. Um, I'm curious as to whether or not we can recruit AOR naval units, as in we can take Antioch and then recruit some Greek um, naval warships, you know, crewed by Greeks, just in our employ. That I would be completely in favour of. That would be great. I love the idea of, uh, of basically the Gallic Navy in air quotes essentially just being Greeks from Antioch. You know, crewing their warships in the service of King Magarix, being paid by him. That works for me, but I don't know if that's a thing. I, I've, I've never checked that before. I've, I've no idea if uh, if AOR recruitment applies to naval units as well as land ones. So uh, I need to put you back in patrol stance, don't I? Yes, we do. Uh, in the meantime, things are ticking over quite nicely. Um, obviously, our main province here is doing well um public order is lovely at the moment it's worth noting of course though most of that is from characters at the moment so from you guys doing your patrolling and whatnot if once you guys move out here and stop doing that public order will come down but i think it should hopefully still remain net positive maybe maybe a little bit um we're gonna have to probably think about making some public order boosting buildings at some point um I'm more familiar with the Roman building tree, really, than I am the, the, the barbarian ones. So uh, that'll take some figuring out. But uh, we will, nevertheless, rest assured, figure it out. Pessinus, they've got their plus one public order at the minute, which is okay. But um, still a little ropey. Um, some of that is provincial, a little smidge of provincial instability that's still lingering around. Um, most of it is cultural differences. Which hopefully, once we've built the, where is it, the Shrine of Tutatis, we'll start to be able to tackle that because it's got plus eight Celtic cultural influence, and we, we need all the Celtic cultural influence we can get because like we've got five point three percent Celtic Celtic culture, Celtic, oh, Celtic cultural, Celtic culture. Yeah, anyway, we have low good culture, lots of bad culture must fix sooner rather than later shrine of tutatis will will help with this also i think probably moving oh, this I dude over there would help with it as well because i think these chieftains will spread cultural influence as well in addition to their usual effect yeah plus four cultural conversion local province in addition to all the other stuff so uh, yeah we should probably move ad gobrutatis is that ad gobrutatis or ad cobrutatis i can't remember that C looks kind of like a G, or possibly that G looks like a C. Uh, I, so much for changing the font to make it clearer. Never mind. It looks kind of... I need to find another C. Honor the <laughs> and your ancestors. Yeah, I think that's our god Retartis. I don't think that's our... I don't think that's a, that's a C. That looks like a G to me. I think that's meant to be a G. Let's like, where's Magarix? Where's Magarix? Let's have a look at what the G looks like on him. Okay, no, I think it might be a C actually in that case, because that's a very clear G. Ah, <laughs> uh, clearly this font, font malarkey was a bad idea. Uh, Ed Cobb Retartis then, anyway. Yeah, I think I might want to move him over this way. It's going to take him a little while to get there, apparently. Alright, there we go. Uh, for now, folks. I have nothing further to report. Oh, actually, there is one more thing I will be attempting to achieve, which is getting Sidae off the, Ptol the Ptolemies. 
And there's a way I can try and do this. It's it's fraught with risk, however, to get it off them peacefully. Now, you can't go into diplomacy, because I've had one or two people suggest this to me already, but they aren't very familiar with the way Rome 2 works, it would appear, because unlike in some of the previous Total War games, you can't trade settlements in uh, in this game. If you go to diplomacy, to there is no option for it. You can do it in a very limited way in Attila, which you might be confusing this with, but in Attila it only worked with uh, hordes. You could you could give a settlement to a horde, and you, you could only give them the settlement that they were stood next to, if you like. If they're in, the, you could only give them the province they were stood in at the time, and that's essentially how it worked in Attila. Um, now the the reason why you can't do it anymore, I suspect, is because um, when in Empire: Total War you could trade settlements, and it was completely broken and silly. The AI just doesn't know what to do with it, so you'd end up with stuff like the Mughals colonizing North America and uh, you know the, the Cherokee colonizing India because because they were just trading settlements with each other like lunatics. Um, and so I think Creative Assembly, rather than come up with a fix for that, they just pretty much decided to disable the entire feature, which is very a very Creative Assembly thing to do, frankly. It's uh, for the, for a similar reason. You can't move units I like these independent of a general anymore law. because of another bug that Creative Assembly couldn't fix, and so they disabled the feature. Um, anyway, long story short, what we can try and do though is by going to the faction tab here. We select a character like Akintawanis here, for example, and we can tell her to go on a di send diplomat um, to the Ptolemies and that will hopefully improve our relations with them. Uh, it can go wrong. It can go wrong. She can get wounded uh, and be out of commission for a while. She can just fail. She can accidentally insult the Ptolemies and lower our relations with them. Um, she can... Yeah, there's lots of results that can come from it, but what, if you get a critical success, the RNG gods smile upon you enough, um, you can actually have the other faction give you a settlement for free um, and in this case because it borders with us I'm pretty sure if we got a critical success with a diplomatic mission to the Ptolemies they would give us sea day I think and that's probably the only way I'm going to get it off them without actually going to war with them so my plan over subsequent turns is going to be to try and run diplomatic missions to the Ptolemies in the hopes of getting critical success and then getting them to give us sea day Alternatively, we may end up insulting them, and war might break out with them, in which case things are about to get very spicy. Um, hopefully that won't happen, though. Anyway, uh, should we, in fact, we might have a go at it right now. Uh, let's see, who do we want to do this? Um, if, if I use one of my own clan's people to do it, it'll be minus two loyalty for all other parties for four turns. Uh, if I use one of them to do it, they'll get more influence. But um, actually, none of them can at the minute because they're all leading armies at, at the moment. Um, but they would, if they did it, they would get more influence, but they would also get more loyalty. At the moment, as it stands, though, there is not really an option. However, that does actually bring me on to another thing, which is that I have realized and noticed that none of the other faction leaders are married. And that's a bit weird. Um... Yeah, I, I, they're not married. They won't just naturally get married by themselves unless you get a pretty rare event pop-off, I think. Um, we actually have to arrange it for them, and I just haven't done it this entire time. Um, and we probably should. I mean, arguably, we shouldn't, because if they if they have a wife, that means they'll get more influence, and it'll upset my plans of becoming beloved on the chart here. However, it's just super duper unrealistic for every lead tribal leader here to be unmarried, and they're not exactly, you know, young either. I mean, 25, he's 38, he's 25, you know, it's weird that they're all bachelors, frankly. Um, so we, I think one of the things we need to do is arrange for marriages for all three of these dudes, and we're going to do that straight away, because I should have done this earlier, and I didn't. Um, there is one positive consequence of this, actually, which is that they will like us more for having done this. It counts as sort of being, as the, as the faction having a character promoted, and that gives you a big loyalty bonus. So there we go. Sokrapo is now married. Sokrapo is leading the Council of Teutons. He's married to Adgina. Let's see. You get an extra little trait thing here as well, which is kind of fun. Arrogant husband. That tells us a bit more about them. Uh, so apparently Sokrapo is, is arrogant. 
which is interesting. Minus one gravitas per turn. I like the sound of that, although minus two public order per turn, local province is not so great. Um, his wife is a beautiful wife, apparently. Um, let's see. Iparkos, let's get you married off as well. Marriage arranged. He is now married to a lass called Cludia. And Iparkos apparently is a miscreant husband. Oh, dear. Bad luck, Cludia. Bad luck indeed. Um, apparently she's clever, though. He has a clever wife, which is quite, quite a nice bonus, actually. Um... And then Caxtos. Poor Caxtos, who's like just the arse end of the pie chart right now. Poor guy. The uh, <laughs> the influence of the Trokmai has just plummeted. He's even less than the Council of Chieftains these days. Poor dude. Uh, that might change a bit, though, once he gets married, though, to be fair. So we'll do that. He is now married to Uwedia. There she is. Uh, she has a rowdy husband. Caxtos is rowdy. I never would have guessed looking at him. Um, plus one loyalty for marriage, minus two authority, plus plus two public order for military presence, local province. Neat, I guess. Not that it really means much to her, because as the, as, as the Galatians in DEI, we, we can't recruit female generals, so this is pretty... This, this bonus here is completely irrelevant. Um, uh, she is an uncanny wife, apparently. I walked the path for you, my love. The trees spoke of you. Plus two loyalty from marriage, minus two to chance of having children, and plus one line of sight. Interesting. There we go. So they're married. Presumably they might have kids, which will also be added to their faction as they get older and stuff like that, and what have you. Does now mean we got three additional characters where I can get to go do stuff, which is helpful. Uh, for instance... Uh, we could send Caxtos' wife, Oedia. We could send her off on a diplomatic mission to meet the the Ptolemies. However, I'm actually going to get Akitawanus to do it because I just like the idea of one of our people doing it more, really. Uh, Role-playing, basically. It's the, the smarter choice is to get one of them to do it, but role-playing, so fuck it. <laughs> you go. Don't mess this up, all right? Don't mess this up, Akitawanus. Don't screw it up. We're counting on you. All right. So she is going to go off to Sea Day and uh, make diplomatic overtures, I guess, in the hopes of banging us, ba banging us the town. That would be nice. Would be. N <laughs> Just noticed that Sea Day's majority po majority culture is Celtic. That's kind of hilarious. Anyway, um, it's because it's part of the same province as these. That 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 city is crawling with Celts right now. Uh, <laughs> Right. I've sat here talking for 20 minutes without even hitting the end turn button. There was a lot to talk about, though. There was a lot to talk about. There'll probably be a big gap now between this clip and the next one as I hit end turn and observe everything that happens in the meantime. I'll probably come back to you when we're ready to actually start, you know, raiding and pillaging again. So, bloody hell. Well, that just happened. Gabranos is dead. Gruesome news. A small sparkling candle is now extinguished. Your diplomats returned with a generous tribute. All right. Well, that's not quite what we wanted, but it sounds like Akitawanus has come back from Sea Day with a big pile of money. We, <laughs> yeah, it's just, we have thirteen point four grand in the bank now. Holy crap! <laughs> I'm going to be spending some of that on upgrading buildings. I think. Um, an assassination plot. The politician appears content with his new post and has stopped plotting against you for now. Ah, that must be the result of a decision from the previous episode. Yes, that was someone was plotting to assassinate us and uh, I decided that Melina wanted to have him promoted so she could keep an eye on him and it seems like it's worked so Kropo is no longer interested in trying to kill Magarix that's uh yeah that's uh that's, that's good I guess keep an eye on him won't we I mean I'll try and have him killed could I Requires two more cunning than the target. Oh no, he's more cunning than than Melina is, so that ain't gonna work. Hmm. Don't think anyone can have him assassinated. We can't do any assassinations at all. Yeah, two more cunning than the target, and he has five friggin' cunning. And he's a wily devil. I mean, Caxtos has six. Goodness gracious me. Um, yeah. 
Hmm. I'll have to find a different way to get him killed if we need to. <laughs> oh, dear. Anyway, uh, yeah, I, I thought, you'd thought I'd keep you up to date on that. Nothing else of note has really happened, though, as far as I know. These Bithynians are being indecisive and walking back home. Um, well, that's about it, really. Oh, actually, no. Uh, the Bithynians have taken Tarsos, which... Uh, as you can imagine, irritates me. I might be sending some diplomatic missions to Bithynia as well in, in an attempt to squeeze some provinces off them as well. Um, actually, because they've done exactly what I hoped they wouldn't do, which is snipe Tarsos. They didn't take Antioch, at least, but uh, yeah. There is a big fat Seleucid army sat in Antioch now, though, mind you. Maybe they'll take Tarsos back. You never know. Depends how aggressive the AI is feeling. Go on, you know you want to. Go clobber those Bithynians, take Tarsos back so I can have it off you. You know you want to, Seleucids. Do it. Go on, do it. Go on, go on, go on, go on, go on, go on, etc. It's September 275 BC. And as you can see, uh, Magrix and this Seleucid guy here, General Decaeus, seem to be having a bit of a staring contest. Magrix is raiding Seleucid territory. I'm happy to report the Seleucids took Tarsos back, as I hoped they would. And they sent the Bithynians running home with the tails between their legs. Um, it could be this guy has come up here and he's going he's gonna to attack us next turn. He might be about to do that. I'd be a little bit surprised, but he might, he, might, he might do it. He might actually attack us to put a stop to our raiding shenanigans. Um, at the moment... Magrix's army looks like this. You'll notice I've lost some of the skirmishers and I've replaced them with a couple of units of mercenaries. Uh, Syrian mercenary archers and Cretan mercenary mercenary, mercenary archers. When I'll Sean Connery there. Um, both excellent archer units. More useful and effective, I think, than the skirmishers. Um... The difference between them is fairly negligible, to be honest with you. Uh, the, 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 the Syrians have more range, uh, the Cretans do more damage and fire faster. Uh, I've got a unit of each. Kakstos, at the back here, he's recruited a couple of units of Cappadocian hired lancers. I, uh, I, I, I sort of... I'm, in my head, I'm picturing Kakstos as being a very sort of cavalry orientated general. He's a cavalry leader. In fact, I actually gave him a um, the Master of Horse ancillary here. Plus four morale for all cavalry units, plus five experience gain for cavalry units. Um, so I'm kind of seeing him as being a bit of a cavalry general. Oh, Kakstos. So I've got a couple of units of Cappadocian lancers for him as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I might be about to go to war. Elsewhere, I've done a thing. Um, I discovered uh, there's a there's a bunch of things I've discovered in between this episode and the last one, as uh, through a combination of your comments on YouTube and also the fact that I've just been playing a ton of the Mithridatic Wars campaign since the new uh, update for DEI came out, and that campaign has forced me to learn a lot about how the mod actually works. Um, my knowledge base has increased significantly between this episode and the last one, um, and one of the things I learned is that governors work differently in this to how I thought they did. Uh, I think I played a little too much Attila and Thrones of Britannia because uh, in those games, provincial governors are assigned through your character screen up here. In DEI, what you're supposed to do is actually recruit a general by himself with no other units in his stack and have him sit inside a settlement and he will act as a governor. Um, he will level up, he'll gain experience just by sitting there in the town and he'll act as a governor and you can take the governor traits when they level up to increase their efficiency and whatnot. And so that's what I've actually got Iparkos doing at the moment. Iparkos and also Sacropo. Um, they're both just being governors at the moment. Sacropo is over in Pessinus. Uh, Iconion is over here in... Uh, sorry, Iconion is here in, 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 in Iparkos. No, other way around. Iparkos is in Iconion. In my head... Iparkos, who is... Which which tribe is he? He's the chief of the Talistabogi. In my head, Iconion has been kind of granted to the Talistabogi. Mazark has been granted to the Trochmai. And um, Pestinus has been collectively granted all of its land to the, the minor tribes, which is why Iparkos is, is ruling here at the moment. That's kind of how I'm seeing it kind of divvied up in my head. Um, 
And so that's why I've got them there. If Parkos actually leveled up a little while ago. Um, I gave him the capable bureaucrat and city governor traits. And role playing wise, I actually feel like that's not a bad idea because his basic trait that he came with is nobility, uh, which is minus 10% provincial capital, main building construction costs, and plus 3% tax rate. So he seems naturally suited to the business of governance rather than fighting on the battlefield. Uh, he's erudite as well, by the way. He's only a deputy and only a scrapper when it comes to brawler and commander traits, but he's erudite when it comes to intellectual traits. So he's a smart cookie, Izzy Parkos. Um, plus one growth per turn, plus two percent tax rate, plus two cultural conversion. Basically, this guy's an ideal governor, and that's basically what I'm planning to use him for as going forwards. Um, Sacropo over here in Pessinus, I believe he leveled up last time and I gave him capable bureaucrat and political reformer as well, which are another, another couple of governor traits. Um, and hope. Uh, the gods will look after the people they always do. Uh, which is appropriate considering he's been overseeing the construction of the Shrine of Tutatis in Pessinus at the moment. That is actually fully constructed now. And uh, Celtic culture is now skyrocketing as a result of that and also as a result of the fact that we've got Ad Cobritatis um, overseeing, helping, helping Sacropo oversee the province uh, by applying his bonuses as well. Plus four cultural conversion on top of everything else. So um, this is going very nicely. In fact, I'm thinking of going to Sacropo here and I'm thinking of giving him uh, an ancillary that might help spread cultural conversion a little bit if there's one available. At the moment, he's got a personal tutor. I did say I didn't want to take these off of these guys, just for the sake of efficiency. I don't think I'm necessarily against swapping it out for something, though. I don't think there's anything here that would really help, though, at the moment, no. So we can keep his personal tutor, I think. Um, anyway, uh, I think I've changed off some things over here to Magarex's um, things at the moment. Oh, he's got a tattooed madman. Let us dance with the badgers beneath the twinkly stars to the tuneful moans of the dying. Ha <laughs> uh, Plus one authority, plus eight percent morale for all units during battles against Hellenic factions, uh, like the Seleucids, for example. I felt that was a, you know, a poignant choice. Um, I also have swapped out whatever he had earlier as well for the Medicus, so plus four percent replenishment rate for all units, which is very helpful. So. Um, that's the equivalent of being in the patrol stance, basically, a plus four percent on that. It's pretty nice. Um, I'm anticipating some combat, so you know. Is there anything else to mention? I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think. Was there anything else that happened in the meantime? I don't think so. My attempts to get C Day off the Ptolemies have so far not succeeded. I've got a few piles of money. Uh, I came back a couple of times with a renowned bard, which increased my uh, public order in my provinces, which was nice. But uh, still haven't actually achieved the desired result, unfortunately. Um, I think I mentioned previously that uh, Gabranos has died. The Wien, age nine. Um, so Dawalos here, age zero, is uh, now the new faction here. The, um, the succession is looking bloody shaky at the moment. I believe, based on prior experience, if Magarix were to die and Daralos were to die, actually, if Magarix were to die anywhere, I think, because Daralos is not of age yet, if Magarix were to die, I believe the game will actually spawn a family relative out of the, out of thin air to take over as your new faction leader. I had it once when I was playing as the Arverni. I did a, I did a small Arverni campaign, and it t it started off atrociously. I managed to lose my only my only settlement right at the start. I did take it back, but uh, it was an absolute fuster cluck that campaign. It was it did not go very well at the start, and uh, I did actually get my faction leader killed as well in the process. And the games basically spawned in a brother out of nowhere, um, who had presumably returned from exile to rule the kingdom or something. But the guy wasn't on the family tree prior to that happening. He wasn't there. My faction leader died, and then boosh! Suddenly, oh look, we found a brother from somewhere. So I think that's probably what would happen if Magrix were to die to take it. If he were to take an unfortunate arrow to the face in an upcoming battle, I think that might be what would end up happening. If that did happen, that would obviously be quite interesting from a narrative perspective. But hey. Anyway, um, long and short of things is that I feel like the Seleucids might be about to attack me. In which case, I think rather than just letting them attack me, uh, 
how about we negotiate with the Ptolemies to pay them to attack the Seleucids first instead? So let's go initiate diplomacy. Join war against... This may involve some haggling. Oh, and here's another thing. Um, declare war against. If we're doing this, I want to be declaring war against... Uh, let's see, their defensive ally. Oh wait, look at the wrong people. Let me look at the look at the Seleucids for a moment. They have two satrapies, Parsa and Hariva, and they have defensive allies in the form of Kyrenaica. So Kyrenaica, Parsa, Hariva. Greetings, Offer to join war greetings. against Seleucids, Parsa, Kyrenaica, and Hariva. We'll night. leave out those guys. Um, I'm ticking all of these. Partly because I might, we might get more money out of it if we tick all of them. But also because I discovered since last time that clicking join war and only ticking Seleucids will mean that we'll only go to war with the Seleucids and none of their satrapies are allies. And that I would consider to be a quite hefty exploit. That's why we were able to get away with fighting Lyd Lydia earlier without the Seleucids actually attacking us. Because I accidentally done an exploit. Uh, an exploit that Creative Assembly did did since fix, by the way. I, uh, I can't remember how it works in Attila, because honestly, the last time I played Attila, I was playing with the Western Roman Empire, and everyone was at war with me, so I <laughs> diplomacy was irrelevant in that campaign. Um, but uh, I played Thrones of Britannia fairly recently, again, with the Shield Wall overhaul, which is very good, by the way. Highly recommend. Um, and in that game, if you declare... If you offer to join war against a faction you non-negotiably have to also go to war against their allies and client kingdoms and stuff so um yeah creative assembly did fix this little exploit but i'm going to try and avoid using that exploit so that's why i'm ticking all these guys as well uh likelihood of success high yeah you don't say payments great ptolemy pharaoh of egypt king of kings he of sedgen b and all that malarkey um, would you like to give us a huge pile of money? Oh, no, no, no. Wrong way around. Wrong way around. A huge pile of money to attack the Seleucids. Moderate success. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming this isn't going to work on the first try, but you never know. No, they rejected it. All right, we'll haggle Pharaoh, with them for a in bit. His divinity, forgives your impudence in offering <laughs> forgives money your impudence. as though he were a common king. <laughs> All right, uh, joint war against Seleucid, Parsa, Cyrene, and Hariva. Uh, payments, demand, I shall demand 9,000. They accepted that, so I've just got a big fat nine grand in the bank to go with my other money. I am now up to, by the way, 14.2 grand in, in the bank. The reason for that, really, at this point, is that I'm, I've run out of things to spend it on. Um, I'm being throttled by my tech. I, I, I don't have the tech to upgrade most of my buildings here at the moment. Uh, that's kind of my fault, I, I guess. I, uh, as I said, I've, I've been playing a lot of the Mithridatic Wars campaign as, uh, as the Marius faction, and uh, a unique feature of that campaign is it takes place much later on, sort of around 80 BC, and uh, the tech tree reflects that, so uh, you don't do a lot of tech research in that, game, cause, in that, in that campaign because it's already done for you. And I kind of forgot that you need to do tech in the grand campaign like this. So, uh, whoops. Can't build anything. <laughs> uh, never mind. Never mind. Um, I could I can recruit units, but uh, my income is at 3.3 .3 grand at the minute, so I could probably afford like another half stack or something before I started to run low on, on income again. But, you know, having a huge pile of money saved up is not a bad thing. It allows you to just spam political actions out the wazoo in an emergency if you have to, which is always good. So, we are now officially at war with the Seleucids. Let's get you out of patrol. Let's get Magarex out of raiding stance. Ah, see, that's dropped down to 2.4k now that I'm no longer patrolling and raiding. And uh, hopefully, if I attack... Yeah, there's a yellow arrow. Lovely. Um, I will save anyway. Drop a little perma save. Let's get this party started. Let's crush a Seleucid army. This is going to be the real deal. They've got Silver Shield pikemen. They've got Greek Bronze Shield pikemen. They've got Light Cavalry. They've got these Slingers. They've got Cretan Archers. This is a real army, folks. This isn't just like the, the, the armed peasants of Cappadocia and Lydia. This is an actual professional army we're about to go up against. We'll outnumber them significantly. 
But I won't lie, I'm feeling a bit anxious anyway. <laughs> I just ran away! <laughs> you scumbags! Oh, they're going to get help from the settlement, aren't they? Uh, on the bright side, Tarsus' garrison is like slashed in half at the moment, almost. Because uh, they only recently took the place back from the Bithynians. So I reckon... And your ancestors. Should we get some emergency uh, mercenaries? I can afford it, so... Some some more Cappadocian lances for Caxtos, and... Some Galatian mercenaries, maybe? Hire some additional Galatians from the homeland to... to, to from, from nearby settlements, towns and villages in the region, just put out the call. Hey, any Galatians out there? The king needs you. Come, come, come give us a hand. These are really good units as well, by the way. Melee attack 12, defense 14, charge bonus 27, armor 25. They're pretty sweet. Do it. Hire the lot. I'm down to four grand now. That cost me a lot of money, but it's going to pretty much guarantee us a victory, I hope. Uh, now I'm going to do this carefully. I'm going to make sure everybody is in range to help each other. See, I'm hovering over you right now, and I'm not seeing that all-important yellow arrow. And your if I move you there... There we go, there we go. It's always finicky. It's always bloody finicky. Right, there we go. So you've got your town levy militia on, on their way to help you, and as you can see, uh, the, uh, they've been a bit devastated by recent conflicts with the Bithynians. Cheers again, Bithynia. Much appreciated. And there's the actual Seleucid army itself. They have... Oh, General's bodyguard infantry hoplites. Hetairoi, which are incredibly good sort of Alexandrian Macedonian style heavy cavalry like shock cavalry they're very good they've got elephants they have elephants ladies and gentlemen oh boy this is going to be a corker I, I think here we go ladies and gentlemen the tribe is ready to go to war we have the high ground it's over Antiochus I have the high ground they're down there the Seleucids by the way can't see them right now um I wonder if I were to move one of my units of light cavalry over this rise here. Would we then be able to see that? Some of them are popping into view at least. Yeah, there we go. Get some scouts up there. There we go. Light horse! Really squeeze you up against the line there. Try and get a bit of line start. We can see some of the army, but not all of it. We were to pop you ooh, all the way down here. Would you maybe be able to see them? I love that scouting is so important in uh, in this compared to previous Total War titles. I oh, know I'm so behind the curve on this. This game came out in 2013, for Christ's sake. But <laughs> you know. Uh, anyway, I can probably guess what's around here. But this is we can have a look at the Seleucids. Here are their Hetairoi. Wait, no, no, these are Tarantinoi Hippais. These are uh, medium shot cavalry. Here's some Long Corifoi. Medium shot cavalry. I don't know where they're really heavy are, though, actually. They're around here somewhere. There's the elephants. Indicoi Elephantes. Yep. That'll be a problem, alright. Theoretically, our unit of skirmishes and also the Gaisati are probably how I'm hoping to try and deal with these uh, elephants, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. Do our basic very light spear infantry have a bonus against elephants by any chance? They actually do. That's interesting. Yes, plus 17 bonus against elephants. Again, because the lack of armor slowing them down. Um, the 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 guy started are better, but actually that that actually makes me a lot less worried about said elephants now because like my pretty much my main state infantry unit has a big bonus against them. So okay, less worried about the elephants now, even though they are still terrifying and they will do some tremendous morale damage to us. Um, you got the pikemen at the back. Chalcaspides. Are these like? Are these like? Th is that the generals unit? You know? It's not, is it? No, I don't think it is. Pikemen, phalanx infantry. They are. Oh yeah, these are the Greek bronze shield pikemen. These are more of them. These are more, more silver shield pikemen. The Seleucid banner. Yeah, they're pretty well armored, aren't they? Yeah, they're gonna be a problem. 
they are going to be a problem. Yeah, this is the sort of situation that old Lentulus would be more than familiar with, because uh, this is exactly this kind of kind of army that uh, the Romans had to deal with at Actium, and before that, actually, and afterwards. Right, the Romans dealt with the battle of by the way, was pretty much the way I described it, actually using skirmisher infantry with javelins. Um, what else have we got? Decaeus. Uh, these are the shield bearers. Right, this is going to be there's the general's unit. This is this is their general right here. This dude. There he is. Like his cool lamella, like arm armor. That's pretty neat. That's pretty cool. But yes, that's the general's unit. Un an infantry unit as well. Pretty unusual. Usually it's cavalry, right? Not this guy. He likes to fight on foot, apparently. Um, cool. Uh, and then they got their sling. Slingers might be a problem for us, actually, because we don't have a lot of armor. Slingers we probably watch out for. These, aha, these are the Hetairoi. These are your Macedonian style, in the manner of Alexander the Great's cavalry companions, essentially. Yeah, in fact, they are indeed, they're called companion cavalry. Uh, these superb cavalrymen are an armored fist to drive deep into an enemy's vitals. These are scary. I'm worried about these. Not entirely sure how I'm going to kill them. Maybe using the Gaisartes, I'm not sure. Uh, the trick will be trying to tie them up somehow. But yes, yeah, so they've got the, um, the iconic funky helmets and uh, leopard skins and whatnot. Yep, they're pretty good. Probably the best, actually probably the best cavalry of their kind in the entire game. I would not be surprised, honestly. Uh, you know, when it comes to heavy shot cavalry, I think these guys probably are the best. Thinking maybe Parthian cataphracts might also be pretty good too, but uh, I, re I imagine the cataphracts are slower and a bit more suited to a, a prolonged melee versus these guys who are all about the charge. <sighs> okay, well, here's what we've got over here. Um, you've obviously seen the scouts already deployed over over here. I'm gonna move you by guys back up here actually for now. Um, that's just my truck me guys separates uh, my very light missile cavalry. Uh, back behind them, we've got a big, thick line of the usual light spear infantry. The dudes. The dudes of the tribe that we've all become familiar with. I have deployed the Gaisartai differently this time, though. I got one unit on this flank, I got one unit in the middle behind the front line, and I got one unit on this, this flank as well, anticipating, basically, elephant and cavalry attacks on our flanks, which will almost certainly come. The elephants might just plow straight up through the middle, to be fair, but the cavalry will definitely be coming at us on the flanks. Um, behind them, we've got uh, Magarex is up here, basically just no trying to apply his morale buff here. I'm, you know, I'm expecting elephant charges, and so trying to maintain morale and cohesion will be important. I've got the baggage train here. I've got our archers. Uh, I'm wondering if trying to use fire arrows to panic the elephants might be a good idea. I don't know if these guys can even switch to fire arrows. We'll have to check once we start, but uh, that might be an idea, actually. Try and panic the elephants with fire. Um, so these are the the Cretans. And over here we have the Syrians, I think. Yes. I love these guys' outfit. That's pretty darn cool. Yeah, you guys look pretty damn, damn cool. I like you. Yeah, these are our Syrian mercenaries. They have the longer range, but less damage. This is these guys who have less range, but more damage and more shots per minute. Uh, oh, anything else? Yes, at the very back, I have the um, the noble swordsmen. Basically, at the very, very back, because I couldn't quite figure out where else to put them, but they're pretty much just here, ready to run to any crisis point that needs their attention. And then I've got the unit of very light missile infantry, the, uh, the skirmishers back here as well, because I'd like to be able to run them to wherever pretty much the elephants are. Um, so they're sort of at the back here in reserve, ready to move forwards when required. Kaxtos's boys are coming up this way, and I'm glad they are, because frankly, I don't think this army would be up to the total job of taking out this army in a 1v1 one, one one slugging fight. Um, that would be a hairy proposition, but luckily we've got a lot of reinforcements on the way. So, folks, let us do this. Let us begin. Oh, we're gonna get speech. Wild animals. They call us barbarians. Today, we Our reinforcements have arrived. Shut up, Marcus. Tear them limb from limb. 
cleave their heads from their bodies, and we shall win the day! Not a terribly gifted orator, I think, is Magrix, but uh, the men seem to appreciate it anyway. Right, Kankstoss and his lads have arrived. Oh, yes, okay, we've got, we've got new toys to play with over here, right. Figuring out how to add you lot to the battle line is going to be interesting. Ah, and the Seleucid reinforcements are on the way as well. This is all the fairly crappy town levies that I'm not terribly worried about, I must admit. Right, uh, how, are we, how are we going to do this? We got... All right, I'm going to... Two units of them on that end, two on this end. Extend the line that way. Move the guy, Sarte. Oh, how did you guys end up skew if like that? God damn it. There we go. Do that. Uh, we've got the mercenaries as well, haven't we? So, I tell you what. And we got Axemen. I almost forgot about them. They could be super useful, actually, in some of these heavily armoured units over here. I, want, I think I want the Axemen out towards the flanks. So I'm going to have a unit of Axemen out here. I don't want... Yeah, just put them like there. I don't want them to be too vulnerable to cavalry. So I'll nestle them up behind the spearmen there. Unit of Axemen there. Unit of Axemen there. And then we've got three units of, of mercenaries. I, I think... Yeah, they, these guys are spearmen, actually, so... Um, I think I'll have oh, quite large units too, actually. Yeah, you there. You there. And a further unit of mercenaries in deep reserve at the back. So we're going to do that. Oh, we got an extra baggage train. We didn't really need one, but we got an extra baggage train anyway. I guess we can move this one over here and this one here. <laughs> uh, I, I suppose. Um... Is there anything else? Oh, yes, yeah, of course, there's the cavalry. It's Kaxtos himself. And his lancers. Where do we want to put them? I'm going to put them... For now, I'm going to put them over to the side here, at the back. That's what I'm going to do. Let's have a look at these guys. Oh, yes. Now that is some cavalry. Not exactly, you know, companion cavalry, but they're armoured. They've got big lances. These guys gave us a rough time in the first battle we did with the Cappadocians. Now they're on our side. I think they've smelled which way the wind is blowing and they've decided that uh, there's plenty of wealth and glory and loot to be had by uh, working in the employ of the Gauls, it would seem. Marvellous. And there's, uh, there's Kankstos himself. Looking magnificent there. Who needs a shirt, right? I will kill any man I see with mercy in his heart. All right, everybody, we're sending the scouts up. Everybody back on the hill over there has gotten into position now. We're ready to march forward. I didn't want to move the scouts any closer until now. Just in case we provoke the enemy to doing something. And I think simply by moving the scouts up, we've achieved exactly that. The Seleucids are reorganizing their entire front line. Ah, he's just said I think they've taken the bait. That sounds interesting. Yeah, they're totally reorganizing. Looks like they're moving the elephants out to the flanks. <sighs> moving the cavalry around and everything. Interesting. I'd, what I'd really like is to try and provoke them into coming up the hill towards us. Because we do have the high ground. It'd be nice to preserve, preserve that advantage. Crest of the hill. We've still not moved. Their formation's pretty much reverted back to what it was. Elephants in the middle. 
The pikemen have assembled into phalanx formation, as you can see. Um, they've moved out their really nasty heavy cavalry over onto this flank, though. The uh, the companions and the long corifoy are now on my left flank, and the crappy Tarantine guys are over on the right flank. They do have another unit of Hatira on this flank, but overall it's weaker. Which is why I've moved my Cappadocians and Caxtos, along with the Scout Cavalry, over to this side. I'm just going to overload this flank with Cavalry, because uh, basically the Cavalry, particularly the Lancers, entire mission statement for this battle is to get behind and charge these Phalanxes in the rear. That's their only, that's their only real serious goal uh, in all of this. Charge the Phalanxes in the rear. Um... And we do that, we do that, we win the battle. We've done an Alexander the Great, we've done the Hammer and Anvil. We've we've won the battle if we can get away with that. Um That's a lot of nasty cavalry. I'm hoping though we've got the we've got the resources on this flank to deal with it though. We've got uh, in fact, you know what on that note. Galatia. How about we add an extra unit of mercenary Galatian spearmen over to that flank? Seems like a decent idea to me. Hey, look, it's the old Thracian faction logo from the original Rome Total War on that shield. <laughs> um, yeah, let's uh, let's move those guys over there. Hopefully that should be enough spearmen to deal with any nasty companion cavalry. Um, yeah. At this point, it's just a question of trying to provoke them to attack us. Um, the Syrian archers might be key to this. They have a lot of range if I hold spacebar. They could shoot all the way down here from where they are, but as you can see that's still a little short of the mark. It'd be a great time to have some artillery really, wouldn't it? But we don't, so. I'm trying to think how else we could do this. I, I guess how much do they have in the way of range units over here they got? Uh, Cretan archers over here. Local archers. Um, I'm, I was I was thinking of sallying forth the scout cavalry to throw some javelins at the enemy, but they're going to be outgunned by archers if they try and do that. Maybe if we can get right round the flank, throw some, try and provoke the companions into attacking. Maybe that's what we should do. Let's sally out there. We're, we're in the earliest stages of the battle right here at the moment. We're in the opening skirmishing phase of the whole darn thing. Let's uh, unselect you. I'm just going to move the army up a smidge further. To there. There's Kaxtos. With his Cappadocian Lancers. Yeah, I need to get you guys right out wide over here. Fortunately, I can't tell you to go into a loose formation. Which is a little annoying. Some reason that ability is dropped for an awful vast majority of units in this game. Um, the old go to loose formation button. One of the things I don't quite like so much about this, it comes back in Attila, actually, weirdly enough. Although I don't know if it's actually Attila specifically or whether it's the mods for Attila that I play <laughs> that add it back in. But you can do there. I play Fall of the Eagles for for Attila, and Fall of the Eagles has really superb battles and part of the reason for that is it has tons of formation options for every unit in the in the game pretty much all right we're provoking a reaction here they're going crazy right now Fire! throw your javelins boys yeah the archers are having a laying into you a bit aren't they that is not having the result i wanted really i thought we might kill a few more than that they're giving chase though Go, go, go. Yep, keep throwing javelins at them. They're heavily armoured, but every little helps. Keep going, though. They've caught you, but don't let them keep with you. Jesus Christ, you guys are supposed to be light cavalry. You should be outrunning these these Hatira easily. What's going on, boys? Oh, uh, yep, there they go. These poor uh, scouts don't have the stomach for a proper fight. What the hell happened there, boys? They're supposed to be faster than heavy shot cavalry. Oh, well, never mind. <laughs> there goes one unit of scout cavalry. Oh, but I think we've provoked a reaction. They're bringing up some of their other cav. The long corifoy are coming this way. And they're getting a lot of javelins thrown at them. Oh my goodness me. Oh yes, please. Oh yes. 
Defense has used all its ammunition. Oh, that's beautiful. That is a thing of beauty. All right. Counter charge them. Get the spear stuck in. One of our units has used all its ammunition. Kaxtos this way. They're forming up into wedges to try and charge in, but uh, they're about to be mobbed by spearmen. Whoa, come back, boys. Come back, come back. Oh, they're on the move. The whole whole line is coming at us right now. Okay, here come the elephants. Where are my skirmishers? Get up here. Shoot some elephants. Um, archers. Flaming shot at the elephants. Rally, inspire. Oh, you idiots. Why are you pivoting like that into the front line? You, you fools! What are you doing? How are things going over here? Uh, the, the companions and the lancers are being thoroughly destroyed. Good to see. Kaxtos, you can engage them. Oh boy. One of our units has used all its ammunition. And there's going to be more elephants on this side, huh? Uh, where are my skirmishers? They're doing their thing. Right, we've got to hope that these light spearmen of ours have what it takes to deal with the elephants. I'm going to send in some more. These are the... Are these? These are the axemen. No, forget it. Don't send them in. Where am I going to start I at? There they are. Time to go slay some beasts, boys. Although you are currently stuck into some... Yeah. All right, you guys are doing well. Off this way. That's the other unit of scout cavalry running. How are things going? Uh, how are things going up here? These big battles are a nightmare to try and coordinate, honestly. Um, everybody on this flank, this way. In fact, move you guys over there as reserves. Uh, looks like the first unit of elephants is either all dead or running away. In fact, yes, they are. They've trampled back down the hill through their own troops. That is great news. You boys, round this way. Start getting to surround these guys. Cavalry. What is that? Is that their general's unit? It is. Right. Try and avoid that if you can. Need you come round here and up this way. Right, you guys don't don't chase after them. Forget them. Attack the elephants. You guys go after them as well. Axemen this way. I see some of the elephants have rallied down there. That's not great, but whatever. Okay, how are things going? We're, we're getting around the sides of some of these phalanx formations. That's good. Um, archers, you can, honestly, you can stop. You, you can go back to standard shot for now. I don't think I necessarily need you shooting flaming arrows at, he, the, all over the place. Oh, see if you can get into that phalanx, that phalanx while they're still vulnerable. There you go. Get, get around them with your axes. Chop them to bits. So There's a silver shield pointman, I think. But you guys have got axes, so you're all about the armor piercing. around and butcher those elephants please boys I think some of the scout cavalry rallied over there Lancers up the hill straight into the backs of these guys make sure they're fighting the, the point in the right direction Axtos into them these Lancers into them do your thing everybody this is what Alexander the Great used to do and now we're using it against his successors how ironic is that Could have been a more impressive charge to be honest with you but never mind should get the job done i hope i want to see some panicking white flags up there um the baggage train is is wavering why is that oh they uh this tiny unit of surviving companions was engaging my noble swordsman all right fine
is we've got this unit of guys sardis here. Can I thin you guys up? Like so. And then slide you through this gap here. Penetrate them just so. Mm hmm. Just like this. Oh, it's not going to work, is it? You guys are getting distracted. Oh, well. Just, just come on, get through here. Try and engage those shock cavalry at least. Right. These lancers. Back down the hill. Go and engage those archers. I think these elephants are all dead or running away. These? Yeah, there go the elephants. Chase them. Chase the elephants. I know you're just cavalry, which means you get scared of elephants, but give it a go anyway. I keep track of any of everything that's happening in this battle. It's, it's difficult. You've got, you got guys just sitting around here doing nothing. It's because I'm struggling to keep an eye on it all. Inspire Rally. This blob of... Uh, of guys in the middle here is it's difficult. What's going on here with these cavalry? You're yeah, so you're, you're running all over those archers, very good. One of our units has used all its ammunition. Our general is under attack. He is. What's happening? Where's Magrix? Oh, there he is. Oh, the um, the enemy phalanx has pushed through our lines a little bit here. Um, Bring up the nobles out in front there. The battle is turning in our favor. Okay, good, 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 good. Yep, we've got we've got wavering running pikemen in the middle here. Very, very good. This flank is more or less completely collapsed. On their side, I mean their flank has collapsed. Uh, these axe warriors might need some assistance. You guys just... Are you poking the elephants? To, that's a really bad idea, guys. <laughs> that's pretty... I'm pretty... I'm distinctly sure that is not what I told you to do. I told you to friggin' throw javelins at the elephants from a distance, you maroons. Alright, never mind. Guys, Sartes, get over here. And then charge straight into the back of those pikemen. Are they pikemen? Or is that... Oh, no, that's the... Those are hot players. That is the general's unit. Well, well, well. Um, Our men flee the field of battle. This is I hope that's nobody important fleeing. I assume that's maybe the scout cavalry fleeing. Alright. You boys into the back of those pikemen there. And these infantry will join you, as a matter of fact. What are those? Those are just archers. You guys are, yeah, you guys are just bullying archers. That's fine. You keep doing that. Who's that running away? Those are my axemen. Oh, well. Actually, go back. Go into the back of them. Right, there's the general's unit. Actually, switch targets. Go to the back of them. I'd be amazed if we can get these guys to rout, but killing a bunch of them would be good. Right, that little unit of pikemen's routing. I don't know if there were pikemen, actually, to be fair. They could have just been, you know. Hoplites. Probably the town levy hoplites, if I had to guess. What do we got over here? What are you? You are... Ah, you're some much skirmishers. You must have run away at some point and ended up all the way over there. Alright, we've got some routing Seleucids in there. Oh, that is beautiful news. Thank you very much. And there it is. We've wrapped it up, everybody. They're all dead. Archers. No shooting. I don't think they were anyway, but I don't want them accidentally shooting my guys as they chase the enemy away. Ladies and gentlemen, it is done. We have 
defeated the Seleucid army of avenged the Battle of the Elephants by murderizing a bunch of actual elephants. These guys are panicking, being wiped out. Oh, it's a beautiful thing to see, everybody. We, we took 2,000 casualties. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, God. That's a culture shock coming straight from having been playing a Roman campaign recently. <laughs> uh, yeah, we deployed 7,700 men. We lost 2,000. 4,400 kills. Um, as you can see, the enemy army has been completely annihilated with the exception of like a unit of slingers and this unit of cavalry. Uh... What do they have that killed the most? Looks like just these slingers. The slingers killed loads because they're slingers and they're throwing rocks at, sharp rocks at unarmored units. So that's not a surprise, I suppose. It's funny how it's the units you don't pay very much attention to often end up getting the most kills. The elephant's got a, a chunk as well, to be fair. And these pikemen as well. The silver shields, they did all right. Yeah. However, our... Uh, I want to see the Syrian archers. No, these are the Cretan archers. They got 135 kills, which is excellent. The Gaisati made a load. A lot of these kill counts are inflated because uh, there was remarkably few uh, fleeing enemies to chase on this one. We completely surrounded and annihilated a lot of them. When I was looking around to give you some post-battle footage there of units being chased down, uh, there wasn't very many to find. They were all surrounded and cut to pieces. Uh, so, yeah. A grim day for the Seleucid Empire, because wow, look at that. They came away from that with a unit of Tarentine cavalry, some Usenoi, some slingers, and a unit of 60 archers. That was it, everything else was destroyed. And two units of local archers for the garrison. There we go, we've got 5,732 men remaining. This is what also makes a prolonged, deep into enemy territory sacking and pillaging campaign difficult because uh, our rate of attrition as the Gauls is pretty horrific as you can see. Lots of experience upgrades though, look at all these, very nice. Caxtos' cavalry now silver chevron, that's very nice. Magrix didn't get involved very much there, I was, I was pretty terrified of him being accidentally taken out by an elephant in that battle so I decided to have him stay in reserve and pretty much just inspire the troops, which I think was a, was the right call because he was able to he was able to be there um, inspiring the troops just as they were getting charged in the face by elephants, and I think that was probably a very very good idea. So, um, yeah, nice. One of the units of scouts has gone up to a silver chevron as well. Good for those guys. I'm quite I quite like my scouts. They're very useful. Um, terribly weak morale though, as we saw. Uh, <laughs> I think some of their horses might be a bit lame because they were apocalyptically slow in that battle. I was, I'm was i not very impressed at all. They managed to be outrun by a bunch of companion heavy cavalry. Don't know what was going on there. Much disappointed. But anyway, um, quite a bit of the baggage train got taken out. No wonder they were uh, wavering there. I think a lot of the enemy slinger kills were probably the bloody baggage trains. Now that I look at them. You scumbags. They like to do that, the AI. They really like to shoot at your baggage train for some reason. <laughs> it's very unsportsmanlike, if you ask me. <laughs> Never mind. The uh, the nobles got an upgrade. Um, I'm wondering, I'm just looking through this right now, and I'm trying to figure out, did our Axemen survive? They did. One of these units of Axemen panicked and started running at the end of the battle, which was very undignified of them. But um, they uh, they are still around, which is good. How many kills did the cavalry get? Oh yeah, they got a lot. The cavalry did some friggin' work in that in that battle. They did exactly what I wanted them to. They pretty much went entirely according to, to plan. They were the ham hammer to the uh, to the, the the tribesman's anvil, 
and admittedly, tribesmen are not a very good anvil. <laughs> you know? They ain't exactly Roman legionaries or uh, Macedonian pikemen, but uh, they got the job done today, bless them. Nice, now what do we do with these survivors? Enslave them, ransom, or kill them? The thing is, enslave would be nice. Um, we'd still have the problem with managing our slave population on account of not owning all of our home province. Still working on that little issue, trying to get Sea Day off the Ptolemies at the moment. Um, so I don't want to inflate my my slave population too much. Ransoming the captives might not be a bad idea. It doesn't, it, as far as I'm aware, this doesn't work like it did in Medieval 2, where the enemy gets the units back, if, if you're wondering about that. They, I don't think they'll actually get their troops back if I ransom them. What we will get, though, is a big pile of money, a very big pile of money, in fact. And also, um... The, it'll actually give us a slight diplomatic boost with the enemy, with, with the Seleucids. Um, and that could be helpful when it comes to trying to piece them out later. So I'm going to ransom these guys. We'll take them all as prisoners. And we'll send, we'll send letters to their families and to, to the king of the Seleucids and say, Look, we've got an awful lot of your army here, mate. Do you want to pay for them to get them back? Otherwise we're just going to, you know, lop their heads off. Um, so we're going to do that, I think. As you can see, you know, they didn't get a chunk of troops back there. I don't think that's how it works. They might get the manpower back, potentially. I don't know. But I don't think the AI really does much with manpower. I think that's a player-only thing. Anyway, um... Let's be having Tarsos, shall we? Yeah, that is a... <laughs> that is one of the most one-sided auto-resolves I've ever seen. Let's auto-resolve that and, uh... Balance stance, whatever. It doesn't really matter. There we go. What le what was left of that army is now wiped out. The town is ours. Naturally, we shall be looting the crap out of it. Uh, interesting to note that liberate is still an option. I may consider doing that in the future as we get deeper into Seleucid territory. I may consider making some client kingdoms that are loyal to the king of the Galatians rather than ruling them directly. That's something I might think about if it's an option. At the moment it says you return the original owners of this region to power, thereby resurrecting their faction. I'm not sure if there is a faction that natively controls Tarsos. It's interesting that this is even here. So I sort of think I might want to save the game before I do that in future, just to see what happens. Uh, but we will we will loot it. We will loot it. It's amazing that you get so much more money from looting than you from sacking. I feel like if it was the other way around, there would be more of an incentive to sack. Um... Never mind. Loot it. 17 grand in the bank. <laughs> that makes up for all the money I spent on the mercenaries, doesn't it? There we go. Increasing rank, Kaxtos. He's Kaxtos is finally ranked two. Hurrah. I think he deserves it after that performance. He was at am absolute MVP with his lances in that battle. Couldn't have won it without him. Um, let's see. Skills. What kind of guy is Kaxtos? Um, funny thing is, he has those slightly pacifist leanings. It's, the weird thing is, he's accompanying the army and doing really, really great right now. But he doesn't really want to be here, if you recall. He's kind of, uh, he's kind of of the opinion that picking, picking large-scale wars with, with regional superpowers is a really stupid idea. <laughs> he's probably right, to be fair. <laughs> but, uh, I tell you what, he is. He's a ferocious warrior. So, uh, plus one zeal, plus three morale for units doing offensive battles. Um, skilled cavalry. I mean, we have to pick it, surely. Um, regardless of the bonuses, that's just too perfect. Some think he was born in the saddle. His enemies think his mother was a horse. 3% charge bonus for all cav. 3% melee about attack skill for all cav. Plus 3 melee defense. Plus 3 shots per minute. Um, yeah, it's, there are better skills to take, but... None that are more appropriate. Skilled cavalrymen. There we go. Very nice. I think that should hopefully apply in battles where he's assisting and where he, which he's not leading as well, by the way. When he's coming in as reinforcements, I think that will still apply to his guys. So, Kaxos is the man when it comes to cavalry. He's the guy you come to, right? However, right now, what I need you to do is I need you to patrol. Try and restore a bit of order in the region. Try and catch any fleeing uh, refugees from the uh, from the regional Seleucid government, you know. 
relieve them of their valuables. Uh, we need to repair the buildings in Tarsos. What do we got? Civil settlement. Mega Fruirian. Whatever it is, it's getting converted later, so who cares? Tarsus is understandably not super happy. Um, what's the culture here like? 0% Celtic, but it's very mixed when it comes to everything else. Look at that. Hellenic, Persian, Armenian, Judaic, and Daco Thracian as well. Wow. Yeah, we get further down here, it starts to become a serious melting pot, doesn't it? That's pretty cool, actually. I didn't even know some of these cultures were in the bloody game, like Judaic. Didn't know didn't, didn't know that was in the game, but obviously it must be, because down here in Judea, I bet I bet it's you've got a really high Judaic culture. That That's an army from Rhodes. Hello, Rhodes. Rhodes is over here. We haven't had any diplomatic contact with them until now. I assume you guys are also at war with the Seleucids. Yeah, there's a huge like there's a huge grand alliance against the Seleucids right now. They're being torn to pieces. <laughs> In the latest version of the mod, um, which thankfully did not break the save game when it updated, um, actually gives the Seleucids a significant buff. Uh, I think they get some spawned scripted armies and stuff to help stop them from completely imploding in the grand campaign, because as you can see, they have a lot of enemies. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't know if that'll take effect in this save game or not, but we'll, we'll see, I guess. Um, it's, I kind of like to see it though. It's it's alarming how quickly they 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 implode. Perhaps I think they they do kind of die a little too fast, perhaps at the moment. But um, it is nice to see them die, regardless. Because I remember in the original Rome Total War, whether it was vanilla or with mods, you always had the grey blob in the east. The grey blob was eternal. It was never destroyed unless the player did it themselves. Um, well, of course, as we know, what happened in real history is the Parthians came in from the east and pretty much usurped all of this territory and they eventually became the, you know, the Sassanid Persians in, in the fullness of time um, and completely overthrew the Seleucids and became the new, the new regional superpower. Um, and, and they, as, you, as you, I'm sure you know, they fought Rome on a number of occasions and did rather well for themselves, actually. Um, and in, in old school Rome, original Rome Total War, it never happened. You never got to fight a late game Parthia. Never happened. The Grey Blob would just eat them and that would be it. You'd, you'd just have the Grey Blob for the rest of the game. So, I have to admit, it's kind of nice to see the Grey Blob get torn to pieces in this game. Because it makes a change. <laughs> right, uh, you guys are... Let's move you out of the town itself. There we go. You can marshal outside it. You can. I can't put you in patrol mode because you've just taken a city. Uh, you've got the replenishment rate's pretty good though. Regardless, um, you have the medicus, don't you? You've got the doctor. If I recall, yes, you do. You've got the doctor follower, which means that yeah, you're getting a bonus to that replenishment, which is very important. But yeah, as you can see, a lot of these units are down to half strength after a single battle, which is another thing which makes. Um, a prolonged campaign into the heart of Seleucid territory without actually occupying settlements? Pretty tricky. If we were to liberate settlements and make them client kingdoms, we would still be able to replenish without actually directly ruling the, the, the settlement ourselves. So that could be what I end up doing. If as we go further in here, rather than trying to rule it all directly, I'll we'll, we'll battle our way through this. Is what I'm thinking anyway. God knows what will actually happen. Um, but one thing is we battle our way through Mesopotamia and I just I just start creating client kingdoms along the way rather than, you know, occupying it. I feel like that would make more sense. Maybe? Possibly? Perhaps? What I probably should think about doing is moving Iparkos to Tarsos to try and take control of the situation there. Because he's probably my best governor at the moment. Uh, Pessinus probably still needs the ministrations of Sokrapo. Because they're, they're, they're happy-ish, but not by a lot. Still got that huge cultural differences penalty. And this place is going to have a huge cultural differences penalty too. Yep, minus 15. Not great. Um, we will be back in the positive though at the moment. As things stand at the moment. Next, next turn, once the minus 40's gone away, we'll be back in the green. But, uh... 
I obsess over public order because I've seen what happens when it gets out of control from playing the Marius campaign in the Mithridatic Wars, uh, which, by the way, I heartily recommend. It is rock hard. It is hard as nails, the Marius campaign, but it is such good fun, and it will teach you, properly teach you, how DEI works as a mod. It'll really force you to engage with all of its systems and learn how everything works properly because it's the only way you'll survive. Um, if you fancy a challenge, play as the Mariani in the Mithridatic Wars uh, campaign from the list on the main menu. It's bloody great. It's a really good campaign. It's If you're curious, it's set... Um, it's it's about Sulla versus Marius the Younger. It's been basically when Sulla marched on Rome and made himself dictator um, in the 80s BC. Um, so it's a really cool bit of history to do sort of what-if stuff with, you know, try and kill Sulla preserve the Republic, you know, don't don't set things off on that dark path towards Caesar and the Emperors. Um, alternatively, you can just play as Sulla and just, you know, have fun doing that. And you can also play as Mithridates the Great of Pontus as well. He's like the third big playable faction in the mod uh, for that campaign as well. And he's probably very entertaining too. He's the one who who, who made himself immune to poison, you may recall the, 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 the tale. Um, by ingesting antidotes constantly, like his entire life, he made himself completely immune to poison, allegedly. Um, right. Okay. I think, folks, I'm going to leave you there. Uh, the, la the last few episodes have been r kind of absurdly long. They were like well over an hour, which is way longer than I normally like my videos to go for. I don't know how long this one's going to be, but the battle took a while. And we spent quite a while on the campaign map before that. So I think I'm going to end it here. And um, I'll join you guys next time. I reckon. When next time, I guess Antioch is our next goal. It's kind of our, our next uh, port of call, you might say. Literally. <laughs> They've got a fleet there, apparently. Don't know what it is. Are you, are you an, yeah, he's proper admiral. So that's an actual naval fleet there. That's not uh, an army in port. It's an actual fleet. Um... Might end up fighting a weird amphibious battle against them if we attack Antioch. Like, kind of, kind of fun, actually. Although, Antioch's got walls, which means it'll be a proper siege. We'll have to build siege engines and whatnot. I... It occurs to me that I have absolutely no idea what kind of siege engines the Gauls are going to have access to. Um, yeah, I could be a bit of an Achilles heel for this faction if we're not able to build things like siege towers and stuff. That might be an issue, but I, th I think we probably can at least build siege towers. Probably aren't going to be able to get the really cool stuff like the tortoise, though, I imagine. I feel like that's probably out of our reach, but I don't know. I don't know. Maybe not. It might, might, might be a tech thing, to be fair. There's a lot of technology to research, especially in the siege category, as you can see. Lots of stuff here. Anyway, folks, done babbling. Thanks very much for tuning in. Leave your comments below. I'll check them as usual. If you've got helpful tips... Feel free to leave them, and uh, I'll get back to you folks next time. Have a good one. Toodaloo. Oh, I should mention, actually, I have had some comments saying, oh, I wish you'd upload more of this more often. Believe me, guys, I'm doing my best. Um, these, these these episodes take ages to record because of there's so much downtime between clips when I'm just hitting end turn and doing empire management. Like, ages. This is the only series I record where I have to have a podcast to listen to. <laughs> <laughs> in between recording clips um so the recording takes ages then the editing takes a fair chunk of time and then i've got to do the intro and that involves writing the intro you know doing doing a first draft and then editing it afterwards into something decent then recording the narration itself and then i've got to get all the footage to do the uh, the actual intro cutscene sequence itself. It bloody thing takes ages. Uh, one episode of this a week is probably about the maximum I can achieve at the moment while also committing to the other series on the channel, I'm afraid. I think I'd have to cancel another series on the channel in order to, to give you more than one episode of this a week, sadly. So I'm doing my best. I'm afraid I can't give you much more than I'm doing at the moment. Um, apologies. I'm, I'm trying, but uh, these, these, uh, these, these, these videos take friggin' ages to put together. It's the, it's the one thing I don't like about it, actually, this series. I, I'm, I'm loving this series. I'm having a great time with it. I've become weirdly attached to this faction. I've been really enjoying my time with these guys. And uh, it's an absolutely fantastic time so far. But, yeah, it takes a lot of time out of my week to make this. 
but hopefully it's worth it. Anyway, that's enough. See you next time, everybody. Toodaloo. <laughs>